And I've been making Linux related videos on topics like desktop environment, file systems, directory structure, package managers and so on for the last 12 years. And it's hard to believe that I have not made a complete beginner's guide to Linux yet. So today's video will be just about that. It will be a detailed guide introducing the Linux operating system, its main components, the ecosystem, how it differs from Windows or Mac OS. Now the purpose of this video is to build a strong foundation and a clear understanding of the inner workings. Though it is a beginner's guide, but we'll be covering all aspects including the kernel, initialization system, bootloaders and further look into the user space programs as well. Now for the sake of better understanding and not to overload with all the information at once, I have divided this video into two parts. In part one, we'll look into the basics of Linux plus the kernel space programs like Linux kernel itself, bootloaders and init systems. And in part two, we'll cover user space programs like file system, desktop environment, package manager, directory structure, the bash and essential Linux command. Now, if required, if I find part two is a lot of information for one video, I may further divide and cover the bash and important Linux command in a third video. We'll see how it turns out. All right, now let's start part one and understand the basics of Linux. First, let's see how Linux is different from other operating system. I'm sure you must have worked on Windows operating system or maybe Mac OS. Linux is also one of the operating system. On a very basic level, the job of an operating system is to manage the underlying hardware, give tasks to processor and provides a platform for user and application to interact with the hardware. Computer without an OS is just a piece of hardware. It's like a body without a soul. But what's special about Linux and how does it differ from other operating system? Well, let's understand this with an analogy. You can imagine an operating system as a house. When you want to buy a house, you have two options. You can buy a piece of land and build the house by yourself or you can buy an apartment fully furnished ready to move in. Now both these options have their pros and cons and suits different needs and different people. The apartment will be quick to move in, doesn't demand any expertise or effort from you, but it will be expensive. You'll not be able to customize it. It's take it or leave it kind of a deal. But if you get a land, you have all the option to design the house as per your liking from build material, flooring to furnishing. All is decided by you as per your needs and as per your liking. Now here Windows or Mac OS represents ready-made apartments and building a house on a piece of land is the Linux operating system. Now we can take this analogy further and we can imagine the piece of land where we build house is the Linux kernel, the solid foundation where everything else stands on. It connects all the physical things, which is hardware, to what you actually use, software. Then there are other components of the house that we can think as representing different elements of a Linux operating system. The bootloader is like the main gate. It's the first step that lets you access and enter the house. Without it, nothing starts. The initialization system like system D is the main door that opens the house and starts everything inside. Lights, air conditioner, appliances. User space is everything inside the house that you interact with. The furniture, rooms, tools. It represents all user level programs and processes. Desktop environment like GNOME, KDE is the furnishing and decor. How things look and feel. It includes your windows, icons, menus and user interface. The file system is like the storage units, cabinets and shelves in your home. Everything is stored neatly and accessed as needed. Applications are the appliances and tools you actually use like the TV, microwave, computer, air conditioner and they help you get things done. The package manager is your delivery service or store from where you can bring in new furniture, appliances which is software, remove unwanted ones and updates existing things. Lastly, the shell is like the remote control or command interface inside the house. It lets you tell things what to do like turning on lights. I think now you get the picture. Linux is an open source operating system. Open source means that the code is available for you to see 
amend and use as you want. Linux offer customization gives you multiple options for each individual element that collectively makes an operating system. Now, not everyone has the time or will to choose each and every component by himself. Here comes Linux distribution or the distros into the picture. A Linux distro is a pre-packaged, ready-to-use Linux operating system built for specific purpose and for specific users in mind. It's like a pre-built house to get you started, but you can still tweak, change or replace things in here. The most popular are general purpose distros like Ubuntu, Zorin OS, Elementary, Mint and so on. They are for general computing for common computer users equipped with all basic functionality required for a home computer like office suite, music player, calendar and so on. These are the one that you should select if you are an absolute beginner and looking for a Windows alternative. Then there are distros like Kali Linux, Parrot OS, Black Arc Linux that is for penetration testing and cybersecurity. Distros like Manjaro, Arch, Fedora, they are for software developers. Alright, now that you understand the basic concept of Linux, let's discuss each individual component one by one. First and the most crucial part of an operating system is the kernel. It's like the piece of land and the foundation where everything is built upon. Kernel is the core of an operating system and without a kernel, there is no operating system. Linux kernel has approximately 40 million lines of code and the latest kernel is roughly 144 megabytes in size. The Linux kernel is primarily written in C programming language, although Rust language is slowly being introduced in some part of the code. One key differentiating factor between the kernel of Windows or Mac OS versus Linux kernel is that Linux kernel is open source. You can see each individual file and the code written in these files. The other kernel level difference is that in Linux, the drivers for various hardware is built into the kernel, whereas in Windows, you get the drivers separately with the hardware. So 40 million lines of code includes kernel code plus drivers and drivers makes 60 to 70% of the code. The founder of Linux is Linus Torvalds and to this date, the Linux kernel is released by him. He is the main lead developer with around 800 maintainers and 4000 plus developers from around the world. Now let's look at the development cycle of Linux kernel. A new Linux kernel is released in every 9 weeks that makes a 9 week development cycle. After every release, a merge window of two weeks is opened. During this merge window, maintainers submit all the new features to Linus. These features have proven to work in their respective development trees. After the two week merge window, Linus issues the first release candidate RC1 of the kernel. For the subsequent seven weeks, only bug fixes are accepted. No new features are introduced during this stabilization period. After completion of seven weeks from RC1 release, a new version of Linux kernel is released by Linus. Now there are two main branches of Linux kernel. First is the development branch, which is maintained by Linus himself. This is also called mainline branch. And the second is the stable branch, which is maintained by another developer, Greg. Stable branch is a forked branch of development or mainline branch. So immediately after the release of new kernel, a fork of this new kernel is made, which becomes the stable branch. Now this branch gets bug fixes and updates. Now this is maintained only for nine weeks duration. And once a new kernel is released, this is discontinued. However, every year, Greg chooses one stable release for long-term support version. Long-term version of kernel is maintained for two years or sometime even five years. Now, apart from these two main branches, there's another branch called Linux Next, which is built daily, adding patches and bugs fixes every day as it is being provided by the developers, but it's not very thoroughly tested. So that was the Linux kernel development cycle. To get a Linux kernel, you can go to kernel.org or you can go to the GitHub pages of Linus for development release or Greg's GitHub page to get the stable version of the kernel. Now, other interesting feature of a Linux operating system is that you can update the kernel to a newer release without breaking the entire operating system while keeping the user space intact. All right, next main component of Linux system is the bootloader, which if we go back to our analogy is the main gate to the house. The function of a bootloader is pretty simple. It brings the kernel, which is on the disk or secondary storage to RAM, the primary memory of the computer. That's it. It does this by scanning the disk looking for a boot sector. Once found, it loads that into the RAM. Boot sector contains pointer to where the OS kernel is located. It loads the kernel and hands over the control that in turn starts the operating system. In Linux, there is one step in between, which is loading a file called init RAM FS or initialization RAM file system, which is a small archive file in CPIO format, copy in copy out format. It contains essential drivers, scripts and binaries, which are loaded first and is used to further mount the actual root file system, which may be on RAID configuration or have an encrypted disk or a network 
network storage. It also set up early user space and load additional kernel modules. Linux has multiple bootloaders, but Grub is the most widely used. In Grub 2, you can change the parameters during boot by pressing the E key, which opens up the Grub config file, which is similar in structure to the Windows equivalent boot INI file. Pressing the C key gives you command prompt where you can type in Grub commands like setting up root or changing the system kernel. Now, if you want to go deep, you can check out the complete list of commands available by going to the Grub manual page. The link is in the description below. File system is another key factor deciding a bootloader. The bootloader must understand the file system used on the disk, such as ext4, b3fs, xfs, or fat32. Grub supports a wide range of file system, and that's why it is the most preferred choice. Further, you can also customize the boot screen changing it to your desired image. If you are interested in that, you can check out one of my previous videos where I showed how to change boot animation in Linux. The link is in the top right corner as well as in the description below. All right, now moving on, the last one for this video is the init program or initialization program, which going back to our analogy is like the main door that opens the house and starts everything. You can imagine the init system as the key of an hotel room, which usually comes in a shape of a plastic card. When you enter a room and place the card in its holder, it immediately turns on lights, AC, TV and other appliances. Now, init system in Linux is just like the card. It boots up services and processes in Linux and makes the Linux ready to use. So, understandably, init is the first program that runs and therefore have a PID or process ID of 1. Alright, other operating system also has init system. Windows has WinInit and macOS has LaunchD. There are many init systems available having different features. Now, systemd is the most popular and being used by majority of Linux distro. So, we'll restrict ourselves to systemd for this video. Two things you need to know to get started with systemd init is the directory used where all the files reside and a systemd concept called units. First, let's look at units. Now, systemd organizes tasks into units. A unit is simply a configuration file that defines a resource or task the system should manage. Each unit describes how something should start, stop, restart and behave, often using dependencies and conditions. A unit can be a service, device, mount points or any of the things listed here. Now, starting an Apache server will be a service unit, opening a port to receive traffic will be a socket unit and when you plug in a pen drive, that will start a device unit. So, I think you get the idea. Now, coming to the directories, the three directories used in systemd is etc systemd system, run systemd system and lib systemd system. Now, these directories contains files used by systemd init system. Lib contains default unit files installed by packages and it varies from distros to distros. Slash run contains runtime units which are temporarily generated during boot and slash etc contains custom unit files created or overridden by the user. This directory gets the highest priority. So if you have multiple entries in different directories, slash etc file will override others and gets the highest priority. Now let's get the complete list of processes running using htop utility. Here you can see PID1 is system and you can use system control, system CTL command to interact with systemd init system. To show all installed unit files, use system CTL list unit files. Now this shows all the unit files installed in the system. To check for running unit files, use system control list units. So these are the files that are running. You can enable or disable a service using command system control, enable, disable, or you can also use start, stop, or restart to perform these action on a unit. To get a list of all the services or a device, you can pipe the output of system CTL command to grep command. And further to add numbers to each entry, you can use the awk command. And by the way, if you want to learn awk command, there will be a video soon explaining awk in detail. So make sure you subscribe. All right, so now you can see there are 47 device units currently working. All right, so here we end part one. I hope that wasn't too much information and you get a fair idea of how Linux works, especially the kernel space programs. In part two, we'll be focusing on user space programs. So stay tuned. And if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button now. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you have any comment, suggestion or feedback, please write that in the comment box. I love to hear from you. A huge shout out to all my subscribers. Thank you for supporting me. All right. So thank you again for watching and I'll see you in part two.